Welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. This is episode 33, going out on December 2nd, 2019. This podcast is for Red Sneaker Writers people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them do it. The big news in the publishing world this time out, at least as far as I'm concerned, is the release of my new book, Trial by Blood, which is the third book in the Daniel Pike series, and it can now be pre-ordered at Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com and Kobo and IndieBound and wherever you get your books online. This book is the most dangerous case Daniel Pike has had yet. It involves a billion-dollar inheritance, the mysterious reappearance of a long-lost heir after 14 years under somewhat suspicious circumstances. Dan takes his case, but it is clear that there are some powerful forces who do not want him to succeed, especially after one of the other heirs turns up murdered in a gruesome way. You don't want to miss this one, so please go pre-order that book. We've talked on previous podcasts about how important these pre-orders have become in the modern digital era, so do me a favor. Go check it out, and if it looks good, pre-order Trial by Blood. On this episode, I will be interviewing Victoria Saravia, who is one of the two co-founders of Beauty Books. That's B-E-A-U-T-E-B-O-O-K, a firm that designs covers and provides other author services. We will also be discussing the latest news, I mean, other than the release of Trial by Blood, in the publishing world. In fact, let's talk about the news right now. My first story this time is about some new voice text storytelling that I have to say, I think this is one of the best ideas I've seen anybody come up with in a long time. You can check it out on a website called Head Canon. That's Canon with one N in the middle, H-E-A-D-C-A-N-O-N, which has been started up and founded by a fellow named Ron Martinez who has been the digital innovator between behind a lot of other programs like Aereo. What he's doing this time is creating a platform for serialized narratives. He's calling them voice books. The idea is that you're going to tell your story in bits and pieces, daily installments that people can listen to on their voice devices, their Google or their uh, their Google Home or their Amazon Alexa device or whatever you've got. I've got an Alexa device in my car for Pete's sake now. So, you know, these things are popular. Well, he's going to give you a way to listen to stories over those devices, each installment being maybe three or four minutes, not long enough for anybody to get tired of it too soon. And each total story taking up maybe 18 or 20 increments. The idea is that each day you can listen to one piece of the story for free. Or if you choose, you can pay a small fee and binge listen to the whole thing when you're on a long trip or something like that. Oh, there's got to be some way for these people to make money. They are investing in this thing. I think this is a lovely idea. I've always loved cliffhangers and serialized stories. And here's somebody bringing that old Saturday morning serial idea into the modern digital age. It's just one more innovative way of writing and telling a story. He's got another idea that even goes beyond the storytelling. He's going to provide ways for people to provide what amounts to author's commentary. Like, after you've listened to something, you can say, well, tell me more, or tell me more about this particular character. And you can hear the author, or whoever has recorded it, talking about how I got the idea for this, or why I did it this way, or the backstory of this uh, this character, you know, giving you the inside track for people who want to take a deeper dive. I think this is a terrific idea. And like I said, this is a platform. Martinez hopes that many people will ultimately tell their voice books 
using this platform, and soon they will be taking applications from other authors. So if this interests you, go check it out, headcanon.com. On a previous installment of this uh, podcast, I talked about what's called California's AB5, a new piece of legislation that's designed to protect people who work in what's now being called the gig economy. In, for writers, that's basically freelance writers, people who aren't employees as such and thus don't get the benefits associated with being an employee, but just work from one assignment to the next. This law would put a limit on how many times or how many hours somebody can use a particular person before they become an economy, before they become an employee, rather, and have to be paid benefits. The idea is to protect people like freelance writers, although some are afraid that it might lead to stifling the whole thing and having people not use uh, uh, freelance writers at all. Well, a couple of other states are getting into the game now. Both New York and New Jersey have now proposed similar laws. In New York, it's a coalition of taxi drivers and and nail salon workers who are getting together. None of these actually speak directly about freelance writers, but I think it could have a big impact on the many of you listening to this podcast, I think, who are, in fact, freelance writers. There's an interesting, if you're into geek facts and statistics and Final Jeopardy questions, go to a website called inthebook.com. It sounds spelled just like it sounds like. They've done an interesting survey where they polled a lot of best-selling authors, basically trying to find out when they first became a best-selling author. When, at what point in your life, did you publish that best-selling author? And the median age, it turns out, the average age, rather, of men and women both when they first achieve bestseller status is, come on, what's your guess? Take a guess before I actually say it. See if you're higher or lower. The average for both, it's no different for men or women. The average age when they achieve bestseller status is 48.8 years. I'm guessing you probably guessed a little bit younger than that. But I think this should be encouraging to those of you who aren't, you know, 21 anymore and maybe thinking, oh, wow, maybe it's too late. Maybe I'm getting. No, you're not remotely too late. You're probably not that far off the average, because if you go even you go to the website and you'll see uh, they've got it broken down by genres and whatnot, but none of them are young. And some of them are a lot older than 48, the point being that people are clearly still achieving bestseller status for the first time when they're in their 60s, 70s, and in a couple of cases, even older than that. There is some variance according to genre. For some reason, the average age of horror authors is only a mere 41. I guess that appeals to the younger people. On the other hand, the average thriller author publishes their first bestseller at 52. I published my first one at 31, which is making me feel pretty superior. But to be fair, that was a long time ago and probably a completely different world. Anyway, if that interests you at all, go check it out at inthebook.com. There's an update on what's happening at Barnes & Noble. You'll recall we published a story or talked about it earlier uh, about the fact that Barnes & Noble has new owners and they have appointed an English fellow, James Daunt, to be CEO. And he's slowly putting in his plans to try and revive Barnes & Noble, a job I would not want, but he seems to be up to the challenge. One of the things he's done lately is cutting freelance writers from all of its blogs online. Apparently, the reason is that he wants to get the local bestsellers more involved in that. If he's trying to make these stores more interactive at the local level, then more power to them. I don't like to see anybody losing their job, but that seems like a smart move. He also said in an interview, I love this, that Barnes & Noble stores are, quote, crucifyingly boring. (laughs) This is coming from the new CEO. Well, yeah. Uh, Query, how are you going to make them less so? I think he's got some ideas, so this will be interesting to watch. One last little factoid I want to throw your way. This came right out of the New York Times in an article that was basically about Black Friday and shopping for bargains. But people were talking about Amazon 
and they quoted a source that says that an increase of one star, one star, in a rating on Amazon correlates with a 26% increase in sales. Yes, you just heard me. The difference between five and four stars can uh, correlate to a 26. That's more than a fourth increase in sales, according to their analyst. Wow, what a difference those reviews can make. I've talked on previous podcasts about how if you're going to review somebody, give them five stars. If you're not going to give them five stars, don't go there, especially not if you're going there as a favor to a friend, because if you're giving them anything from five stars, you're probably not doing them a favor. I know some people do shop just for books that have got four stars or more. So once their average drops below four, which is easy to do, the first, you know, first time a couple cranks go on and don't like your book and pow, your average is just sunk, regardless of how many five stars you've got. So don't do that. Unless, and I mean, you know, I'm not up there because I think I'm John Simon or some famous critic or something, and my opinion is so wonderful. When I review a book, it is almost always to help out a fellow writer. You're not helping if you're not giving them five stars. You may be responsible for them losing a 26%, losing 26% of their sales, and you don't need that on your conscience. So when you review those books, be generous. In my writing tips segment this time, I want to talk a little bit about writing community. It's probably not a big surprise to anybody that I think this is important. This is why I started the whole Red Sneaker Writer thing and encourage people to listen to the podcast and go on Facebook and join the Red Sneaker Writers group where I try and provide useful information or sign up for the newsletter so you can get every two weeks my useful, I hope, this and that information. I think there is a tendency, I know this was true for me in the early days, to either be or feel like you're in isolation. Like, yeah, I think I can write and I think I've got a good story to tell, but how do I convince anybody else? Sometimes people are not getting the support they need, even from people who live in the same home with them. So these are all attempts to help people feel like others are reaching out and supporting them. There is a very supportive writing community out there, and you just need to find what works right for you. So if you haven't already signed up for the Red Sneaker newsletter, which is completely free, please go to my website and do it. It's williambernhardt.com. Just give me your email address, which I will not sell or use for any purpose other than sending out the newsletter. And in exchange, you get this fabulous bonus content in addition to the bi-weekly uh, newsletter. That, to me, and the retreats and the annual conference, that's part of building a solid support group, a community, somebody to bounce ideas off and find out what's going on in the world. Well, there's somebody else who feels the same way I do, and this is an editor and former literary agent called Mary Cole, Cole with a K, K O L E. And she's just launched a new web page called Crit Collective. Crit, as in short for critique, collective. Go check it out. She's calling it a quote, online dating for critique partners, in quote, website. It's completely free. It's basically, you can post your willingness to be a critique partner or the fact that you're seeking one. And there are all different kinds of things you can post availability for or your need for. You can be, you know, you can be looking for a sensitivity reader or an actual critique partner or maybe just a beta reader for something you've already finished. Whatever it is, there's probably somebody there who would like to participate in it. The forum is moderated, but it doesn't really get involved. You post and you find what you want. And it's I think designed to help answer the question, how do I find a writing partner? I'd like to get a, some feedback, but I don't really know anybody. The people where I work don't read or I don't have any friends who are interested or uh, the worst, really. Your friends do read it or say they've read it and they say, oh, Bill, that was wonderful, which doesn't help in the slightest. How do you find out a way to get real feedback? Because feedback can be so important. 
Speaking of that newsletter I send out, the most recent one that just went out a couple days ago, the lead 